Welcome to The Bridge, fun conversations on culture, life, and everything in between. Welcome to The Bridge. We are a show that connects East and West. My name is Jason. I'm originally from California, and now I am living in beautiful Wuhan, China. Today with me is Alex Schur. Hello, everybody. This is Alex. I am from the Northeast part of China, and I'm talking to you today from Beijing, China. Find us where you get your podcasts. If you like the show, then consider pushing the like button or giving us five stars. Suggestions, comments, anything you would like to share? Email us at welovethebridge at gmail.com. We love the bridge. Today we have a special guest. Dalton Grant Jr. is a storyboard artist on the Emmy award-winning Tumble Leaf and DuckTales programs. He has worked on Cars, Shrek 2, SpongeBob 2, among others, a veteran of Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks, Amazon, Netflix, and Nickelodeon, he wrote Relocated to Beijing. His and his partner's studio, Floating World Animation Studios, work with some of the biggest names in China, like Tencent. He has also storyboarded projects for massive brands like Angry Birds. Welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, we're a culture show, and you know, we're very interested in your time in China, so we wanted to ask you a little bit about that. How long have you been living here? Uh, for about three years. All, all in Beijing? Uh, yeah, all in Beijing. Well, what do you think about it so far? No, actually, I love Beijing, and I got to travel down south a bit, mm -hmm. and um, for me, is as much as other parts of China are really awesome. I and I even got to travel to Shanghai. Mm. I just love Beijing. There's something about the city. Maybe it's the first place I'd ever been to outside of the country when I'm from where I'm from. So it's really interesting seeing Beijing and growing mm. with it. Well, where are you from exactly? I'm from California. Where in LA, California? LA. Los okay. Angeles. Great. Another Californian. I'm sorry, NorCal. Sorry. Okay, moving ah. on. <laughs> <laughs> NorCal. SoCal, NorCal. That's, that's a thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It, yeah. A little a little bit. I think they're hats and stuff. Actually, I don't really care. I've been down south. It's nice. I've been to San Diego and Los Angeles. They're mm. both very lovely. I actually went to school in Northern California. It's funny you say that. So, <laughs> But I used to get that a lot down there. But it, it's awesome in both spots to me. Yeah, I noticed that you one of the universities that uh, were on your CV that I looked at briefly was... Um, a, a, I'm sorry, the University of, could you remind me, sir? The Academy of Arts University, San Francisco. Is that San Francisco? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, that is that is San Francisco. So yeah. Well, how, what did you think of San Francisco? Oh, I love it. Uh, Bay Area is amazing. Cool. I spent my adult life there, so it was pretty awesome and got my chops there too. That's how I got the job at DreamWorks and uh, at DreamWorks North and uh, Pixar North. Wow. Uh, so could you tell us a few of the things that you like about living in China? Man, the food. <laughs> <laughs> the food is so good. And the palate, they, there's so many different flavors and textures here. So it's just amazing. Mm. You're just never bored. So uh, I'm not really familiar with storyboarding very well. You draw the pictures for how the scenes are going to move so that later other animators uh, follow <laughs> the creative design that you've you've implemented. Is that right? Or, or how would you characterize it? Yeah, really lay it out for us. Um, yeah. So <laughs> our listeners can understand. That's the gist of it. Um, technically, what happens in at least feature film is you get a script that is not fully finished and even though the film has mm -hmm. funding or a budget of some sort um, they're not fully greenlit the actual full production so they bring in a story artist to mm -hmm. look at this at the script and try to visualize what the script is doing and basically our job is to make a rough cut of the film through our drawings. And if the buyers like it, mm. either investors or distribution, um, then they'll do a buy off and then we flesh it out and create a better script or, or, or uh, rewrites. So that's what a story artist's job is mainly. We're a combination uh, like architects mixed mm. with also sales. When you are uh, involved in this creative process, are the directors or the writers or other studio executives like in the room with you or consulting with you on what angles to take? Or do you have a lot more autonomy? It's a mixture of both. It, and honestly, it really depends on the, the leadership. Like some films you'll work on and the leader has a vision. And sometimes mm. the leader, even with a vision, would prefer your your feeling about why you're doing it. So basically when they hire you, they're hiring you for your style and your sensibility and things that you feel natural about. Mm. At least at Pixar, what they would try to do is just allow you to be you. Mm -hmm. And they try to blend those things together with other artists. Could you tell us a little bit about maybe the difference between working on Shrek 2 versus SpongeBob versus Cars and like, so, because I think a lot of people are interested in what you're doing, but it's very little is known about it outside of 
that there are these really cool pictures that sometimes yeah. people buy. I think people buy some of these pictures, right? Absolutely. Um, it's the art crazy. books, right? Yeah, the art books mm. for sure. The making of all of that stuff and DVD stuff. Um, it, so at DreamWorks, it's it's a little bit more corporate. I don't mean that disrespectfully. I just think it's just a different take on how to do things. Um, and the creative process is uh, different in a lot of ways. I'm trying to think of an easy way to put it without trying to marginalize anyone. Um, so on the Shrek property, when I came in, I came in midway of the film and a lot of the film was being redone. So a lot of what I was doing was trying to help clean up the issues that they had had before I'd gotten there. So in a weird way, I felt more like a fireman, like I was <laughs> going in, putting out fires. <laughs> so it was a different type of experience. Um, whereas like on cars, I was from the ground up and no one had ever seen mm. what that world was like. So we got to create a new world mm. from start. And with Shrek, it's kind of like mm. it had a legacy already. So you have to follow previous rules. And then after you get those rules, you have to try to do new things with them. So it's creative, but just in a different way. And the two studios were operate very, very different. I was one of three story artists up north, and the rest of the story crew was down south. Mm -hmm. So we would do these really weird pitches in a, mm -hmm. in a in a room where the room was like a mirror on a projector of the room I was in, but it was other people from the down south on the mm -hmm. other side. And <laughs> so so they could see us on their mirror, and I could see them on our wow. mirror, and we were like real height, actual height. So it was very oh, bizarre so like, uh, <laughs> what's that thing called hollow almost kind of like hologram but wow, but 2d not right. 3d exactly it was more of 2d hologram but just eerie but super cool and you'd have to pitch to a room of people and that usually was not as exciting because it was corporate and it was very like matter of fact um and then pitching down south was or rather um with uh pixar mm. was a more intimate and we would mostly pitch with the director, like John Lasseter at the time. Um, and he was very kind of like an artist artist. Mm -hmm. So he was super relaxed, even though it seems intimidating working with one of the mm -hmm. industry's best. He was super, super relaxed and not intimidating at all. Mm -hmm. And um, he was really hands-on. Whereas at at, mm -hmm. at uh, DreamWorks, they're not so much mm -hmm. hands-on. Well, how would you characterize uh, Amazon, Netflix, and Nickelode Nickelodeon as a TV channel? But they have more than one channel. They're actually a uh, kind of an almost a little empire into themselves. That's a very kitsch, very, very, very child oriented. Whereas Pixar and DreamWorks, they're watched by like adults too. I feel like Nickelodeon is more like just really for kids. So was the management like child oriented or like, how did that work? <laughs> <laughs> Do you, you bring know, your kids to work? <laughs> no, no, uh, you could, but uh, no, I mean, so oddly enough, the Nick guys were even more adult, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> behind, you know, scenes. Uh, you would never know that mm. those guys were making SpongeBob. It's really interesting. <laughs> but whoa, whoa, I am interested in details of how you say how, how no one ever got slimed. So like, what would, what would, constitute a person looking like someone who would work on spongebob's like what's the what's kind of the base of of judgment right there if i see someone i'm like oh he looks like he works on spongebob's well like you said uh he he said very very well <laughs> it's, it's like a kid's property so you imagine some guy in a hawaiian t-shirt but no it's not that's john lasseter <laughs> these guys look like bikers from like a biker game <laughs> oh <laughs> like, <laughs> wow really yeah, interesting tattoos everything and you're like wait huh <laughs> <laughs> wow very interesting i i actually thought you were gonna say three guys in like ties and a suit with briefcases that's what i was thinking as well <laughs> but then biker <laughs> guys thinking? came out of nowhere wow very interesting oh yeah vince vince and those guys are super awesome and and they love drinking at lunch and then going back and then coming up with new <laughs> ideas it's like super amazing i love working with them super fun wow that's great so amazon and netflix they make their own independent animations i actually didn't know that i don't have netflix could you tell us some of the projects you worked on with them yeah so so with Netflix, I did some stuff with actually by way of Canada through DHX animation. And I was working on the equestrian girls and some of the My Little Pony series. As, long as they were, as we were working with DHX, it was for Netflix streaming. And then, um, so far as, uh, uh, Amazon, I was on Tumbleleaf and it was supposed to have been a one-off 
child show, but then mm-hmm. it turned into something much better once it started winning all those awards. Um, Cause before I got mm-hmm. there, it had won five Emmys. And then when I was there, it won an additional eight. So it was really interesting mm-hmm. like working on that, but that was more of a stop motion piece and Amazon's not structured like a mm-hmm. traditional animation house. Um, they have, They have different studios that are subcontracted and they use them to create new ideas. And if they fit in their slot, they'll use them on their servers. I grew up even, you know, this was like, I don't know, the 80s, 90s on DuckTales. So when I saw when I read read that you worked on DuckTales, I'm like, I didn't even know (laughs) DuckTales was still being made. So, like, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I I got an email randomly. Um, I'm not sure how they got my name in their database, but somehow it came up and the DuckTales crew called me and said, we're relaunching DuckTales. Would you like to be a part of it? Would you come in and test and do all this stuff? And I said, sure. You're like, duh. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) man, it's like my childhood (laughs) happening in front of me. Like that's the reason why I I do Mm. animation in the first place. DuckTales, like growing up on that stuff. Wow. Now you have settled in Beijing and you have established a studio, Floating World Animation Studios. So why come to China? Why, why come to Beijing? What, what is this opportunity all about? Well, After working for so many years in the United States, we're oversaturated with a lot of the same ideas. Uh, Most of my resume Mm. is based on sequels. And it was odd because even Bass Mm. working on Wish Dragon 2 was asking me to work on that. And I was thinking this, everything on my resume is the second of something. (laughs) So, um, but, but having said that, um, I was just kind of like, well, I think there's a bigger opportunity for new IP Uh and this market is hungry for new ideas. Mm. And I wanted a fresh, a fresh start on some of this new content and how to grow it and be better at what I do. So um, why Beijing? Is is Beijing where uh, movies, animation are being done? Are there other cities? Why choose this particular city? Yeah, there are. And uh, Guangzhou is a lot bigger in animation, has a lot more animation studios and talent. And so does um, Shanghai as well. Hmm. But Shanghai is more um, international and Chinese mixed. Mm -hmm. But Guangzhou is more national, which meaning uh, China. Mm -hmm. So it's funny, like, I think Beijing as a hub city is just one of the stronger places to be so far as policy and the changing of things. So as long as you're here, you can hear on the ground, like, what's good for networks? What isn't? What are they saying about films Mm -hmm. what are they not and as long as you can follow those guidelines you can be creative within Mm -hmm. them so you are you guys working on your own independent projects because you're also working with other talents like tencent so are you taking on the the projects that they would like you to take up or are you looking to create your own individual you know original products it's kind of a mixture some things we develop on our own as as our our personal ips but then there's projects that they have through other companies and we're almost like consulting and helping produce those things as well. Mm -hmm. So it's working with local talent mostly. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. and in doing so, we're trying to help build the animation industry here. Mm -hmm. And the idea really is to get the animation industry in China as robust as it is everywhere else. Because there's a ton of potential here. So, I mean, I guess with animation, it's a little bit different than a lot of other movies. So when you're thinking about making a new product, um, are you thinking about it's going to be in English or it's going to be in Chinese? Or are you just thinking, wow, this just could be whatever language we want it to be? My thought has always been it's all about story. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, story is about people. Mm -hmm. So as long as there's people here, there's a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I guess my question for that is like, what's the, from the, you know, the birth of an idea to the fruition of it, like what's the most exciting part for you as an artist? Uh, Learning about other people's flaws. (laughs) (laughs) We just went from like, I was like, I'm looking for, I'm looking for like drawing or or, or animating. And this suddenly became like very philosophical. Well, the beauty of, of the flaw is that if you can illustrate that feeling and capture that spirit because you've seen it and you experienced it, it's, better from your voice so that is the art Mm -hmm. can you give us an example of the past work you've done yeah like um where you saw the flaws of the characters well oftentimes like it's shape language right so let's say you're looking at an old person Mm -hmm. and they have a hump in their back and they walk you know very slow Mm -hmm. and they have a cane and the cane looks pretty Mm -hmm. ancient like you don't know where they got it and, or their shoes, like they found it. Mm-hmm. The beauty of looking at someone and understanding their life would be 
how did they get to this point? That flaw that they have is from, you know, working in a coal mine mm. or being mm. um, on a construction site for a lot of years and their hands look weathered. And so the shape that they take, if you understand that, you can add mm. that nuance and then that becomes mm. the art. Um, so you're primarily concerned with visual medium, but I'm before I get to some questions about how do you tell stories through visual mediums alone. I'm kind of curious, how do you, as when you're storyboarding, how do you incorporate ideas about the audio component, not the music, but like mm. uh, discourse between various characters? Well, we first try to do a thing where in, in visuals, you'd say movement, too much movement, but will your eye naturally, like in nature, will look at where the movement is. And we're, we're designed to do that to survive. Mm. So if you walked outside into a, a bush and you see brush, You'll see subtle movements of leaves and trees and grass, mm. but the thing that'll bother you is large movement. So we always have to, when framing things, think about what's moving the most versus what's not moving as much. So if the character is speaking the, and has the floor, you make sure everyone is doing more subtle mm. things around them and you make the main character do the most boisterous things. So the eye goes straight to them. So when I'm... when I'm, it doesn't seem intuitive. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of detail. <laughs> I mean, it gets intuitive when you start realizing it's kind of like a dance, like a play. Mm -hmm. So you think of it in terms of, well, there's an introduction and then you first show everyone the space and then you introduce them with, mm. with movement, how that space should function. And then the sound mm. helps pace it and gives it a rhythm. There are some shorts that are coming out. They don't have any dialogue in them whatsoever. It's mostly just about movement. How mm. does, how do you approach the topic of telling a story without any words in that story? Well, shape, shape language is a universal human experience. So we all relate to shapes in two ways, positive and negative. And when we see certain shapes, we understand how to feel. Mm -hmm. So it's up to us to look at the feeling of a, of a show or a movie before putting any words. And what you would want to do, even, even in things that have dialogue, my main focus at first is how does this feel when I look at it? And if as I'm laying out my shapes in an mm. orchestrated way, my first thought is, is that capturing the feeling of sadness? Is that capturing the feeling of, of happy? Mm. Is that capturing the feeling of awe? Mm. So what we do in those sense, like let's say a character is feeling really down, you would want to shoot the character meaning with the camera looking down. And that means that they would be below the horizon, like they're underwater. Mm. They're having struggles. There's an issue. They're sad. So there's different ways of staging with cameras and setup that kind of intrinsically when a human looks at it, they have a certain feel about why it looks that wow. way. Is there like a, are there books on this topic <laughs> or do you just feel your way through it each time? Yeah, there are books. There are books because there's a ton of visual tricks that we've learned over the years. Like, um, like uh, even if you watch things like Citizen Kane, like old films, hmm. Orson Welles did a great job with figuring out, you know, low angle cameras and how that makes people feel when mm -hmm. <clears throat> someone's talking to you mm -hmm. and you're looking mm -hmm. up at them. So even something that simple is very powerful. So do you work on uh, commercial projects? What I mean by that is like, literally, do you work on any commercials like uh, television commercials or advertisements of any I kind? Or is, are you primarily concerned with cinema? I haven't done much advertising, although there's some folks I've worked with that have worked in advertising because they're really good at capturing shape and language super fast mm. so they have they're really quick they don't have those things worry about the flaws of mm. the character yeah. no not at all i mean well i mean they do they but they they know it so succinctly they know exactly what to say mm. you know it's mm -mm -mm. it's very clear what kind of projects it, is your studio working on now um mostly animated series like kids show series um although mm -hmm. we're trying to there's this weird thing happening where adult or not adult, but preteen is starting to, or the kids are growing up and they have <laughs> buying power and that now they have phones and iPads and stuff. It's easier for them to access the items from it. So we're trying to hit those new markets and it's more of like preteen kind of adolescent stuff, like growing, coming of age stories and stuff. Mm. So these are television series or uh, movies? Uh, TV series. TV series. Yeah. Well, that That's really, really, really interesting. So th these are like on TV itself or are they accessed by other mediums? Um, access through t streaming, I would say. Mm -mm. So streaming is actually doing something really unique. I've been in animation for over 20 years and 
I was here before the major, I was in animation before the major shift to streaming. And the funny thing that I'm starting to realize, especially from these big distribution groups that stream, that the line of what's considered film and television is different from when we were growing up. Like mm-hmm. traditionally, you go to a cinema and you watch a movie. Now people are streaming it on their devices. So mm-hmm. series are taking this strange long form. I remember it used to be like 22 minutes. That was a or a thirty minute episode, and you'd say, "Okay, thirty minutes," but the it was really twenty two, and you had mm-hmm. commercials. But all that stuff's gone. Like now, it's like on TV, you can make it like a movie, like mm-hmm. Breaking Bad or uh, Better Call Saul or any of that type of stuff, or like mo- mini mini uh, mini films, film series, right? Where yeah. the episodes run like an, an hour, hour long. Wow. Yep. So now it's the language of film and TV is being blurred Mm -hmm. that line. Mm -hmm. And even in kids shows, it's like they're, they're asking for even smaller bites. So you have to do everything in like five minutes. So it's not so bad if um, you understand the overall structure, because we still follow the same basic three act structure stuff like a film. But what we do is that we pare it down to, you only have a minute Mm -hmm. to say this. You only have 30 seconds to do this. Mm. What is the typical like attention span for a child watching a cartoon? (laughs) All day, (laughs) actually. (laughs) Because some kids, man, they watch the same thing over and over. I've seen seen my friend's kid just sitting in front of her iPad for like two hours and she's not moving. I guess the bigger question you should ask is what's the attention span of the market, of of uh, leading the marketers, (laughs) the advertising agencies. Mm -hmm. Um, They tend to want to put more in your face because they can and they can sell more that way but actual kids want to sit and watch the same thing (laughs) over and over yeah i mean i've seen that with full length movies but i you know i'm not sure like if they're understanding the story and you know you i watch a movie like a you know a regular movie sometimes two or three times before i get some of the subtler points unless it's like ten tenant then i have to watch it ten times yeah but like (laughs) but like uh so I'm wondering if, if they're just absorbing different information from the plot by watching it over and over again. But like I, what I mean is um, if a long form TV show like Better Call Saul is an hour, yeah. right? Like what is a, a the typical length of a program that you would put on a streaming service without watch, re-watching it? Like is it 22 minutes or is it longer or is it shorter? How, how much can kids absorb in terms of one watch? Well, the, the main thing that you want to do in any of this the time slots is just you have a beginning you have a middle and you have an end Mm -hmm. it's much like how we live our lives right Mm -hmm. it's it's a reflection of how human beings literally live you wake up you go to work you have a middle of the day and then you have your downtime and then it has to come to a close where you sleep so Mm -hmm. if you think of it in terms of that like even children understand that intrinsically everything is linear in that way. so you're saying it doesn't really matter how long the program is as long as the complete story could capture the 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 kids uh, attention absolutely absolutely actually i'm really blown away about the philosophy that my day is a movie I love that. I thought my day... That's going to take me years to absorb. I thought my days were just about opening my eyes and closing. Well, you guys are missing out. (laughs) Wow. So you think about this like all the time, how how, like life is playing out as a story and like reflecting on how you can take that and incorporate that into your art. Oh yeah. Well, that's a, that's, that must be pretty an intense way to live. Yeah. Do you find it like, you know, <laughs> stressful sometimes? Does it ever feel like a burden <laughs> that you have this kind of artistic interpretation of what life is? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Like I think this being present makes it easy. Mm, right. Mm. So like, and like you said, like when you first watch a movie, it's your first pass. You're not thinking about all that stuff. Mm, in mm. theory, if the film is really good, then it's an experience. Mm right it moves you when you watch Mm. a really good film at the end you feel exhausted Mm. you know you're like man that was a lot (laughs) you know sometimes i'm like i need more why 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 can't i just exactly i'm gonna i'm gonna can i stay in this right this movie movie theater and just doing (laughs) right (laughs) just gonna say doing again yeah it's true it's true but but and i and i love that feeling as well right so and that's the beauty. That that means you were present mm. the whole time. It wasn't long enough, mm. right? That's life. Mm. When you enjoy things in life. You oh want to wow, keep going. that's uh wow. That's yes, never life is never long enough. 
Oh, wow. That's a, uh, oh, wow. I know. <laughs> I, I was, yeah, this is way more philosophical interview than I thought it was going to be. You know, I want to switch gears a little bit and come back around to being in China and, you know, conducting your business here. Do you speak Mandarin? No, I do not. Uh, although <laughs> I'm trying to learn, but very terrible. So my question is, what are some of the hurdles that uh, you and your partner are overcoming working here in China? Um, I think the big thing for me is that the Chinese market is young. And so, mm. and China has an interesting way of getting to where they are today. And they didn't use a lot of the methods that are used in Western mm. thinking. So the one thing that mm -hmm. I've noticed with the communal way of working, it's a very strong pecking order, but simultaneously people don't want to take responsibility for everything that they do. They want it to be the unit suffers as much mm -hmm. as the individual. Whereas in America is very much like, no, you mess that up. Like, oh. <laughs> so it's like, dang, you just die by yourself. <laughs> so, it, so it's kind of endearing in a lot of ways, even though it can be stressful, mm -hmm. but it makes a lot of sense because it's like no one's alone, mm -hmm. right? You're, mm -hmm. you're going to go down, you're going down together. And I kind of feel like, mm. well, that's a lot better camaraderie. Are there mm. any anecdotes about uh, about how your work is different in China that you're willing to share with us today? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, for one, a lot of the production schedules in TV is very hectic and random. A lot of I've talked to a lot of production managers here. They run into the same problem. And that is um, the schedules change, The everything's up to change and everything's negotiable. So even though everything that from a typical schedule, from a typical budget is supposed mm -hmm. to run a certain way, there are a lot of things that a lot of people don't realize is affecting mm -hmm. Uh, like dominoes in both directions. Mm. So someone will change something random arbitrarily and not know that mm. it has an effect in two directions above them and below them. And so you don't find out about it until it's a train wreck, mm. <laughs> you know, gassed up trying to figure out how to fix it. It's like um, when you see it, it's almost too it's late. Too late. <laughs> yeah, you've already, just the fact that you're seeing it is, is where it's all bad. Mm. But the key is like not to panic. You know, it's more like, again, remember I was on Shrek 2, uh, the firefighter. <laughs> mm. I just have to know my exits and then I'm good. I can go into that fire and feel calm. <laughs> so that's how I feel about working here in a lot of ways. Like there's a lot of fires, but it's not that crazy if you think mm. about the overall reasoning for why this exists mm. that way and where are we going. Um, so you're working with certain brands and groups here and you have a lot of you know, you're thinking about creating your own projects. What is the future you, you see for your studio here in a year or two or five years? Or what, what do you hope to accomplish? Well, I hope we create IPs that are memorable and that help build a new legacy of artists. You know, like I, I want kids to look at something that we create here and dream and want to show their story and be a part mm -hmm. of it somehow. We mentioned kids a few times, myself and, and you included. Are you ever think about uh, when you're making a show for kids? Let's start there. Uh, do you ever think adults are going to watch this, too, because mom's going to be sitting behind <laughs> their daughter or whatever? Like, how am I going to make this relatable for both kids and adults? Well, yeah, because the, to be frank, I'm an adult. So <laughs> kids stuff and not making it mature in some way would drive me crazy. Mm. <laughs> So I like the fact that most of us are adults doing it. It's kind of like we are in touch with our inner child and the beauty of ch children in that sense is that they're open. Mm. They're just innocent. They're ready to experience things. They're not as judgmental up, up front. It's not to say that we don't, but we try to leave that at the door. Mm. You know, like like the idea of like when we're create, trying to really be truly creative and open, it's like you have to get rid of all your guards you have to get rid of the things that you think are making you good mm. and you have to just be willing to fail. You know, a lot of animations that come out today are for kids, but you know, originally it seems like a lot of the cartoons that came out in like the 1920s and thirties, they were mm. aimed at adults and it's, it only slowly that the medium sort of like was more aimed at kids, but there are some examples of movies like Titan AD, for example, oh, yeah. that are squarely aimed at adults. Is your studio also interested in, uh, that demographic? Yeah, for sure. Um, I've been always, I mean, I'm a big advocate of that. Like I, I used to love when I was coming up the Akira film, mm. those guys in Japan, like changed my life about how to look at this art form. And so it's, it's, it's just moving 
pictures. At the end of the day, it's still moving pictures. Mm. Like even a film is moving pictures, mm. really 2D images looking like a photograph, photo reel, but still moving pictures. So we don't look at our art any different. You know, it's mm. just a way, it's a medium that we use to tell stories. If you're approaching a project for children, which seems like maybe often, what do you do differently to think about like innocence or how they're going to see it differently from an adult? Like, are there like certain like, you know, do you put on certain like imaginary goggles to see through their 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 perception of reality? Well, I try to a remember when I was little and some of the things that I, you know, did that was I thought was fun and crazy. <laughs> um, also, like trick wise, you can just put film the film from the level of the character. Mm. So if 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 you're like for example if you're watching Finding Nemo if we film it from a human's perspective we're just looking at fish in the water <laughs> And we're looking down and I'm like, hey, there's, there's Nemo. Well, now he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, let's, let's, let's do it. Oh, God, no. <laughs> but that's true. That's what we do. We don't care. But but if you put us in the fish's level, if you mm. put the camera at where how a fish sees the world, you suddenly start to realize some very basic things that are fun mm. and interesting from that point of view. And we do the same with children. Well, wow, yeah. Do you have any like aha moments that you have uh, developed in you know your time in China or your time in the United States that have helped you grow or rethink your approach to animating or uh, to storyboarding? Um, yeah, in China, it's been mostly just how people do things uniquely different mm -hmm. here. Like I, and also being in a city where there's so many people <laughs> and, and I love the fact that like it's, there's this very careful appreciation for like the past and, the, and it's like the past, the present and the future all in one spot. Mm -hmm. And it's like mm -hmm. opening me up in a way that I never thought I, I could think in new ways. Like I went, actually when I was in the U S it was like, I felt static. Mm. Like the cities feel like you're at the same Applebee's, the same Starbucks, <laughs> at the same, like everything <laughs> feels that way. No matter what city you go to, it's like still Applebee's, mm -hmm. it's still Starbucks. It's still, <laughs> like the white people are going to be here. The black people are going to be there. Like it's always that same thing. So you're like, man, this is, where is, where, where else could we offer? There's got to be more to this. <laughs> you know, and the best parts of America is like when you go down home, like Kentucky or you, you, you go into the South. You, so it's like some, there's some awesome down home things there too, mm -hmm. but it's just hard to see through that, through all the plastic. Right. Mm. So, mm. but, and then in China, it's kind of like the plastic is there, but everyone knows it's plastic. So, <laughs> Uh, so they're on some other mission and you're like, wow, that's interesting. Mm. And there's tradition and what? Uh, so you just want to run with it. Actually, I was I wanted to get you to open up more about that because I'm I'm from the Bay Area and San Francisco is actually a really small town. You know, there's less than a million people that live there. And I think a lot of San Franciscans think it's a big city, what? but it's not. Yeah. It's yeah, it's like 800,000 population. It's actually quite small. Yeah, it's very small. Los San Francisco. It's very yeah. small. I am. This is changing my world. It right looks big because the, 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 the rolling hills make it look like there's and the number of people <laughs> talking about san francisco I know, I about know, living in san francisco you tell me there's only eighty eight hundred thousand people it's put its mark on the universe <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> i think it's just close to hollywood and it's another city so they're like let's mm. just shoot there because it's you know it's not <laughs> here but it's and it's somewhere else but it's still close anyways yeah. i wanted to ask you as someone who comes from a legitimately large city los angeles and as far as the united states considers them i think it's new york chicago los angeles those are the three big cities true like you're now in a, this super mega city that's a little it is bigger than los angeles yes how would you characterize some of the differences between los angeles and beijing um la is very very, really, how do you say, um, uh, segregated, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, mm. there's a lot of like cultural oddities that in, for the, for Westerners, you know, it's, you stay in your lane, I'll stay in mine and we're good out here. It's like every lane is everybody's lane. <laughs> and, everyone's lane. <laughs> and it's like, wow, that's awesome. Right. Like I'll, I'll be, we'll be partying or something. And then afterwards, like at a club in America, if you party, you go to a specific spot um, for food and that kind of thing. But out here, it's kind of like you go after a party, you'll see the Lambo next to the little food cart. <laughs> like, and you're like, dude, that's awesome, mm. right? Like everybody is going to eat here. <laughs> like people just know where the good food is. You know so what they're what? waiting for, Jason? You know what the people driving the Lambos, what they're waiting for? They're waiting for that gym. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's awesome. That's like, dude, that's dope. In America, you would never see that. 
the Bentley's mm. not going to go to that food cart. Mm. <laughs> it's like, that doesn't exist. Oh, well, that's really interesting. <laughs> At least not in LA. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I never really thought about that. I guess San Francisco's kind of smallish, so everyone sort of has to go everywhere to go somewhere exactly. at all. So, And, you know, yeah. like, uh, I think Dave Chappelle one time mentioned that a lot of the segregation is missed because the Bay separates San Francisco from a lot of the rest of the populations in the Bay Area. <laughs> it's so true, yeah. though. You're right. So people don't yeah. notice in San Francisco as much. But, you know, I, I, I've i not lived in L.A., so thank you for that that insight into things. Um, I was wondering if, you know, you don't have to name drop if you don't want to, but do you know any Chinese celebs we may have heard of? Uh, Joe Wong. The comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what would you say that you know now about, you know, your own industry or where you want to go that you didn't know just a couple of years ago? Well, I've noticed that IP creation in the United States is based on a lot of legacy products. Mm -hmm. And when I got here, I realized they d don't have any legacy products out into the market yet. Mm -hmm. So... Oh my monkey God, I mean, Every, everybody's <laughs> making a Monkey King movie. Yeah, of course. Um, and well, I mean, it's safe in that sense. When I say legacy, I mean, um, uh, Monkey King hasn't been known to the planet and selling selling in, in multiple markets yeah, yeah. for the same reasons that other films and TV series have been. So because that hasn't existed yet, there's a huge market or a huge opportunity, mm. a huge window that I think is very rare mm -hmm. Um, where technology, growth, and affluence are meetings, art, science, and life. So we're at a moment and an impasse mm. where the world is now has the conduit to actually watch this stuff like cell phones and servers and things all over the planet. So Belt and Road mm. will help expand that even further. So it just tells me that we're there's a lot of room to have more stories to be told in new ways. Mm. And I'm I'm really curious about being so. A part if of I that. understand you correctly, you're really hoping to take some of the uh, Chinese art projects that your studio is involved with and help them go global. Yeah, and I mean not just mine. I, I'd like to encourage even the local groups that are are not us to do that. I think mm. I think the beauty, the one thing about animation that I learned from America, like even being at Pixar and DreamWorks. Mm. And, and Disney for that matter, it's kind of like we're all international. Like a lot of the artists are like from Russia, they're from they're from Tanzania, they're from Korea, Japan, China. So it's like all of us have something unique from our experiences mm. to talk about. Mm. And what I'm saying is if the world, if, if America is a melting pot of the planet with the sole culmination of everybody's culture colliding, it'd be nice to now start digging into some of the cultural things and relevance of the lifestyles in these mm. specific mm. spaces. China is one of them. Mm. And China has a huge opportunity to showcase that. Um, uh, next question. Um, when you're approaching a new project and you, you're, okay, here's your project just dropped in your lap, say it's cars or whatever, anything at all. And there is no map for how to start storyboarding. Where do you get your creative, uh, you know, spark from? How do you start off a new, a new project? Uh, new projects is with either an idea or a character. So I'll be going through life watching something like, for example, and you know, I've been wanting to do this for a while and probably You'll, I'll drop it here. Why not? Um, the choker. We get the, we get the first, uh, first dip. <laughs> <laughs> the Comoran, the Comoran. I, I love the, the Comoran's a bird in Guilin in uh, mm -hmm. Guangxi province. And it, it's a fishing bird. So there's a fisherman and there's this little bird. It's kind of a very large bird with a long neck. And these birds, they put these little rings on their neck or a little mm -hmm. belt. And the bird will go into the water on command. Like you tell it like a dog. Really? Get in the water and get me some fish. <laughs> and it will go in the water and fish and bring the fish back. And it can't swallow the fish because it has the ring on its neck. Uh -huh. You pull the fish out and put it in the bucket and you tell it to do it again. But after it catches at least seven fish, this mm, fish can, mm. this bird can count. It's crazy. <laughs> um, it gets mad. You're stealing my fish. And oh, like you have to yeah, feed you, me now. Well, I'm not. I'm not getting back in the water until I get one of those. And then you give him a fish, he loosens the collar so he can eat. And then he's like, okay, okay, I'll fish again, I'll fish again. And then they, they have this weird relationship and they've been doing that for thousands of years. So I want to do like a, a short, when I, when I see that, I think of like an animated short talking about the choke, I call it the choke bird because they literally grab him by the neck, hmm. and put, him on the, put him on the boat and they're like, wow. <laughs> and they, and they love their masters. It's really, it's a really fascinating <laughs> relationship. Wow. The birds that could count. 
Yeah, like literally they know. <laughs> like, nah, man, I'm not getting no more fish. <laughs> you saw all those fish I just caught? <laughs> yeah. Like, that's awesome. Appreciate mm. it. Exactly. Like, it's it's demanding, mm. you know? And I was like, wow, that's really neat. And and the fisherman gets it, and he'll kind of laugh or <laughs> go, okay, okay. Well, okay, so you basically you're preloaded <laughs> with all of these ideas that you're picking up from your life every day. And when you come to a new project, you're like, well, I've had these two or three insights into like how I want to approach a project. I'm going to combine those and, and just kick this off. Like, is that what you mean? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So this, I think you already answered this question. Maybe you could add to it if you'd like, how do you, how do relationships within your studio uh, work with, you know, other teams here in China? Well, we act more like consulting because of my years of experience. I tend to see where they can just be better for themselves. What I try not to do is change what they've been doing as much, mm-hmm. but I try to figure out where they can improve um, how they work. So mm-hmm. it, a lot of it is selfless. And then it's like my experience can tell me, well, even though you've done it this way, you can't mm-hmm. just start from scratch. You, you, but what you may need to do at this point, at this stage is mm-hmm. this, and then we can get mm-hmm. to the next point. And then, efficiency Mm. um what do you think in this field firstly you know kind of why are you here you know and what do you find fulfilling about this work well i get to help people you know like at the end of the day just making disney richer is not making my life more fulfilled Mm. after all the years i've been in the states doing that i'm it's not making me happy. It's making their grandkids very. very <laughs> the Disney the, grandkids. The Disney, yeah, they got all the Shrek. All those guys. They got all my. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I know at least out here, it's like I I can see the impact mm. different mm. because we we're at the peak. You know, America's at its mm. peak, and we've peaked, and now we're coming down off that high, whereas China hasn't peaked mm. at all. So I think it'd be better to start in a space where I can help build, I can help mm. put a brick mm. in there. So when it does peak, I can say, Hey, but I was a part of a bigger mm. thing, mm. you know, right now in America, I can't really say that I've got an animation. I'm like, everyone is legend. <laughs> You're nobody. <laughs> da, da, da. Like, it's like, man, you feel like, mm. like nothing. So mm. that's not fulfilling mm. to me. Next question is like, who do you look to for inspiration who has already come before you or is working, you know, at this time that you look to in animation or in movies to say, that's the kind of art that I hope that I can, I can do. Miyazaki. Mm-mm-mm. Hi, Aww. Miyazaki. Yeah. It, Everybody. Oh so my God. Uh, what would you say some of your favorite movies are, whether they're animations or not? Um, let's see. Children of Men, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, oh, no. <laughs> Psycho. Um, oh, oh my God. Oh, it's classic, can... classic. I know, but Citizen they... Kane. Okay. Um, let's see. Chinatown. Well, why? Why? Choose one or two of these movies and tell us why it's an inspiration for you. Um, well, it, even something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which sounds crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, why? Well, I just like the fact that I was watching the original and I was counting the camera cuts. Mm-hmm for a certain scene where they introduce the main villain mm-hmm. in the, the film. And um, as I was counting the, the scenes uh, or the shots, they, they literally cut maybe four or five times. Mm. And they said so much with so little space. And that budget was almost nothing. Mm. Um, the lighting was natural, all natural light. Mm. So there was a lot of like the blown out shots where you couldn't see everything and, and, and it allowed your mind to do a lot of work as well. Mm. And it was just really clever, like how they were able to do all of that in such a little space. And it just made me think like they were really, really thinking. And I, it just, when I see stuff like that, it makes me want to want to create. I want to be better. I'd like to take take a wild guess that that wasn't one of your inspirations <laughs> when you're working on Ducktales. <laughs> uh, no, uh, uh, for Ducktales, it's more like my love of adventures and uh, mm. like thinking of like Indiana Jones. You um, know, like like the Spielberg, the spirit of adventure. Mm. You know, the one thing Spielberg does really well is like makes you feel like you want to go mm. and do something awesome. You know, actually, mm. your description of like using different camera angles and cuts uh, makes me feel like I'm not even really watching movies because like <laughs> the, the things that you see in the movie are completely wasted on me. I feel. 
<laughs> now you have to rewatch all of yeah, the movies like, you have. What are re-watched. they trying to say by having the angle? This is going to be a whole new. I can rewatch every movie again now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's true. You're going to get a lot out of yeah. it. I tell you, We're watching West Side Story was like beautiful. Oh, the new God. one the new or one. the original? Yeah, oh. the new one is insanely beautiful. Hmm. It's got that that staging storytelling all over. It's like oozing hmm. with love. <laughs> I was like that is crazy. So good. Well, you know, you've been here for three years living in China. Had you come here to ch- come to China before these three years? Yeah, I came here 14 years ago or 15 mm-hmm. years ago. Um, and I made a short film about uh, Elephant Trunk Hill, which is in... Oh, the one, the Guilin. Guilin. The one that's on... I kept thinking that's on the Chinese, uh, the R&B bill, but it's not. It's the Yang Shuo mountain Yang Shuo that was mountain, on yeah. the... yeah. But that Elephant Trunk Hill is very famous. Yeah, very popular. In is that, that trip, that uh, working trip, was that part of your reasoning when you came to China to work? Yeah, I, I had um, I had talked to a student that her mom at the time was one of the head of or, or president of the publishing house, one of the third largest publishers in China, children's book publishers. Mm. And um, they were trying to figure out who could come over and help them take their IPs from children's books and turn them into animation. Wow. So part of that process was meeting those folks, and then they exposed me to a world I didn't even mm, mm. think or could dream. So um, you mentioned traveling outside of Beijing, and you just mentioned Guilin. Where else mm-hmm. have you been, and you know what were some of your best experiences here in China? I um, went to Shang- Shanghai. What did you do there? <laughs> Uh, not a lot. <laughs> I mean, just like all this stuff that everyone kind of mm. does in LA. I don't know. I was, I, I was a little disappointed in that. I always imagined something else and it wasn't what I thought. I, heck, I even think Hong Kong's way more fun because oh, wow. it's just, it's just this, unique and this, different. The Shanghai like... folks who are listening are like, Re- really? I know. I know. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I love you guys in Shanghai, man. But bro, you're just no. like LA, like you're exactly like Los Angeles. So, you know. I, but I, I see a lot of people who've never mm. been to that side mm. of the world, my side of the world. Mm. So I think it's cool for them, like seeing their mm. reactions. So you mentioned earlier segregation. So you're saying Shanghai has elements of segregation. It's it's funny, yeah, because you say, you, you know, they have the Bund and then they have like the French concession. That area is like completely different. And you kind of know, hey, stay in your lane. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like these are where the Lambos are and these are where they are. Yep. Yeah. You, it's very huh. much that. It's very much that. So you go, oh, okay. Um, but it's self-segregating. You know, I, it wasn't imposed by anyone mm. particular. And that's the difference with Shanghai. Like, they're a lot more open than folks in L.A. Well, if you could tell our American listeners about China, that things that they wouldn't think of or wouldn't realize, what would you tell them about China that you don't think that they already know? Well, it's not gray. <laughs> <and> <laughs> colorless and lifeless like uh, communism and all that stuff it's like the way people think about the way people live here is like fascinating to me i mean Mm. first of all this place is extremely high tech shanghai included like Mm. wow like insane the building the architecture how they build and the marvel of how people choose to live their lives under any regime is insanely it's like Mm. a blessing and I think if most people give it a chance, they'll see a life in a world of that, that they can relate mm. to automatically. Is there something that your friends, like when you talk to your friends and they ask you, you know, like for me, I, my friend told me this, this granted was a couple of years ago. She was, uh, she, ta- she uh, taught in China and then she went back to the States and she continue, continued uh, to teach. And <laughs> one of her students asked her, they were like, Miss, you know, whatever, you lived in China. So I want to know, do people actually travel in uh, uh, horse carriages? <laughs> oh, gosh. So like, oh, it's, 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 my friend told me that I was like, oh, well, I can't really blame the kid. His kid was seven mm. years old. So like, is there, what's the most kind of, re- not ridiculous, but just what surprised your friends the most? Is there any remark that they made that make you go, well, you need to come here and see it for yourself? Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned I had Starbucks and they said, there's Starbucks there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, dude, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> 
They got everything. So, okay, in terms of missing stuff from back home, you know, I'm some. My personal thing is Taco Bell. I don't know why, but like, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah what yeah, are the yeah. things that you, you? What do you think? Yeah, what do you? Th- what what do you kinds of things do you miss about being back in the states? You know, I, I mean, my family mostly. Mm-hmm. I and I also miss. Sometimes I miss knowing what people are saying around me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But. But I, when I, it's weird though, like I miss it when I'm away from it, right? And then when I'm in it, I'm like, golly, can I turn everyone off? Is, it, is there an <laughs> off switch for this? Yeah, I, I felt that way too a uh, little bit. When it was a reverse culture shock, I went back and it was like, whoa, everyone mm. is talking and I understand everything. It's a little eerie. <laughs> like, right. do, do, do like they I'm, know I can hear them? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Oh, man. I'm invading <laughs> other people's privacy. Yeah, I feel it's like odd. It's very strange. Wow. Uh, so uh, three years in. Beijing, is there a particular kind of... You mentioned food. What kind of food do you like about China? There's so many varieties of Chinese food. Man, all <laughs> of it. Like the noodles. They have a million noodles out here, dude. <laughs> a million. There's so many different ways. Hot pot. They got, uh, what else? Uh, um, Sichuan mm-hmm. pepper. Yeah. Like mm. those flavors. Like this, like, what? What is going on? The way they do chicken. <laughs> You know, I'm black, so when we do chicken, we love chicken. This, this they do mm. chicken out here. Well, could you give us one example? One example of how they do chicken out here that you want to share? Man, th- so what's that? That I don't know how they. I don't know if it's like rotisserie or not rotisserie. What do you call it? It's like chuar. Oh yeah, yeah. When they when they put that special seasoning on the chuar on the chicken. Uh, so oh, like, the chicken wings. The, the oh, because yeah. yeah. I was man. like, what are you talking about chuar? And uh, yeah, I, I, I that's something I don't usually order. I usually get the young roe chuar. Oh, oh, see, and that's good too, man. See, you're killing me. And then, <laughs> then the chicken palm, chicken palm, chicken feet. You, are you good. like the chicken feet? Wow, that's an. Oh, oh I, I love didn't that. know Western oh, people man, it. were into the chicken feet. Oh. I, w- I didn't know I was into it either. When I first saw it, I was like, no, I don't want to eat the claw. I was like scared of this thing. It's going to come alive and it's going to scratch my inside. I had all these thoughts about what it's supposed to feel like in your mouth and. But no, it's actually, I was like, man, that's how, oh man, I was killing it. I, I what about, it. what about, what about this? What about the thousand year old eggs? Oh yeah, my favorite thousand year old eggs. How can yeah, I forget they're, that? They're actually chemically treated, right? They're not really a thousand years old. <laughs> <laughs> they could be, and they're going to become little dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know how they're made. Um, some people say that it's, you know, it has kind of a dose of lead in it. I don't what? know about I don't know. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think that's true. I think someone. I don't think that's yeah, true. That's misinformation. I, yeah, because I, I eat too much of them. <laughs> <laughs> and and even if it has lead, I'm giving me. <laughs> You're becoming Iron Man mm-hmm. or something. Yes. Oh, that would be funny. <laughs> Literally. Leadman. <laughs> It was a really great privilege having you on the show, uh, Dalton Grant Jr. And uh, I just want to mention, you know, if you guys are interested in a, an excellent storyboarder, looking for Floating World Animation Studios. And thank you so much for coming on our show. Hey, thank thanks you, for Dalton. having me. Thanks. Right. Thanks. It's Bye-bye. been great. Bye-bye, everybody. Later.